Hey, what's up, everybody? Hope everybody is well. Uh, coming here, a little, um, a little stream before Christmas here, just to um, check in with you guys and thank some uh, new subscribers that I've got. Uh, and want to just thank everyone that's been subscribed and it's been uh, participating in my channel for the last few months. I really appreciate you guys. And what I want to do in this stream is I have a couple of new books that I wanted to introduce and I wanted to share a prayer with you guys. And uh, so there's going to be a lot of Christian stuff coming your way in this stream here. Right. So if that makes you uncomfortable, uh, that's OK. Uh, and you were kind of like me a little bit ago. Uh, stick with it. Uh, in the name of Christmas, let's stick with it here and let's engage with some ideas of, uh, of Christianity and Christian mysticism and uh, let's kind of see where they take us. Um, I am a, a very scientifically minded person. I um, have a degree in philosophy. Uh, I appreciate and, and understand the importance of rationality and critical thinking. Um, I'm also someone that is engaging with Christianity uh, I, I don't know, wholeheartedly maybe, I am wrestling with the idea that God did become man in Jesus Christ and and um, existed and still exists in this world. I am working underneath this pattern. I mean, I'm, I'm engaging with it, probably, um, you know, stumbling uh, uh, along my way here. And I wanted to share a prayer with you guys. And I don't know if uh, even if you should be sharing prayers like this through this medium, I don't know if I'm doing this out of pride or a sense of uh, to get more likes or YouTube subscribers or whatnot. I don't know at all, but I uh, this prayer is, is one that has worked uh, within me for the last few months, and it's a very short one, and it's a prayer about prayer, and it's, a, it's, a, and it's about um, not knowing what you want and allowing Christ to work through you. Again, coming from a, a scientific minded and a, a rationalist type of perspective, this this is going to sound kind of crazy, but just stick with me here. And I got two books here that I'm going to introduce after and we're going to read through one of them here, uh, which I found really, really, really compelling and fascinating. And I'm going to recommend them. So first, let's do the prayer. The prayer is from uh, it's the prayer of Filaret, uh, Metropolitan of Moscow. And we'll just get started here. My Lord, I know not what I ought to ask of you. You and you alone know my needs. You love me more than I am able to love you. O Father, grant to me, your servant, all that I cannot ask for. For a cross I dare not ask, nor for consolation. I dare only to stand in your presence. My heart is open to you. You see my needs of which I myself am unaware. Behold and lift me up. In your presence I stand, awed and, and, and silenced by your will and your judgments, into which my mind cannot penetrate. To you I offer myself as a sacrifice. No other desire is mine but to fulfill your will. Teach me how to pray. And that's it. And this comes from this little book here. It is a, uh, it's a book for uh, Orthodox prayers for um, young adults and children even. So... That's kind of where I'm at in my spiritual progress. Um, and uh, so I wanted to share a couple of books that just came through that I've ordered. Uh, the first one is uh, Acquiring the Mind of Christ, Embracing the Vision of the Orthodox Church by uh, Archimedrite Sergius Bauer. And I'll read quickly from the back here. Uh, St. Paul clearly states, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How do we acquire this mind of Christ and where is it to be found? For the Orthodox Christian, salvation is the acquisition of this mind of Christ, which is to be found in the church. This acquisition moves us from the image of God to the likeness of God. Through our obedience to this call, we begin to know God and this knowledge is eternal life. This small, bo this small book hopes to begin to answer how acquiring the mind of Christ is possible and why it is necessary in our lives today. So that was from uh, Acquiring the Mind of Christ, a really short, uh, inexpensive book. Um, and, you know, I don't currently go to church, so I'm not currently participating in worship, at least. Um, and I don't participate in all of the sacraments in the church and whatnot. So I am coming from a place of apostasy, if, if I'm outside of that. And I'm uh, really trying to engage with it and potentially, hopefully, God willing, get back into the church and... Um, Maybe that will happen here soon, but I don't know. So um, just uh, work with me through these uh, 
through these times and engage with me. And if it gives you some help, uh, great. So next book is one I'm going to read from too. Uh, it was recommended by um, Timothy Petitas, who wrote the book Beauty Will Save the World. I think that's what it was called. And it's entitled The Roots of Christian Mysticism, Texts from the Patristic Era with Commentary. And it was recommended for those that are uh, just new to the church fathers. It's got a lot of excellent quotes and some commentary from the words in, uh, of the church fathers. And I highly recommend this for people that are starting this journey, especially if you were like me coming from an Eastern mystic tradition. I studied and participated in Taoism, uh, Qigong, uh, meditation, uh, things of that nature, which I still hold in very high regard. Uh, it had a tremendous effect in my life and continues to do so. But, you know, when I found this, the, the church fathers in Christian mysticism, I just had no idea all of the, all of the ideas and all of the, um, these perspectives that seem so oriental are found deeply rooted in, in the early church fathers. And they are explicated in a way where I have not found them like that, where they just ring true to me. I don't know if it's, if this happens to others, you know, but they just, they ring so true to me and have such an effect. So I want to share some of this reading for you. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm wrestling here with, you know, Christmas time of what it means to, uh, to love unconditionally and what this love that Christ was bringing into the world. What does that mean? What is that? And how can we uh, understand and engage and relate to this understanding in, in this expression of unconditional love or the idea that God is love, uh, right? So to me, it's important to, uh, uh, at, at this time, in this, in this time and space, in this world right now, these ideas are probably more important than ever. And again, I'm coming to this ignorant and I'm coming to this looking to learn um, and opening myself to, to Christ, hopefully that... Um, you know, he will enlighten my mind and then I can share some of that with you. But again, I could, this could be pride. This could be, uh, you know, who knows, but, um, we're just going to go for it anyways. So let's see if I can get the lighting a bit better here. Hold on one second. All right. Again, the book is, uh, the roots of Christian mysticism by Oliver Clement, uh, quickly in the back of the book, uh, by linking together a series of brilliantly chosen texts from the early centuries of the church. The author lays bare the roots of the deeply mystical spirituality that has flourished among Christians throughout the ages. This is a book that will appeal to anyone who is interested in the field of spirituality, as it is, mass, is a masterly, it is masterly contribute, contribution to Christian scholarship. Let me read here from the, uh, I'll read from the table of contents here. Again, uh, we'll kind of see where this takes us. So uh, there's a preface in the introduction, which hopefully I'll read with you guys here. Part one is understanding the mystery. Some of the subsections are quest, encounter, and decision. God, hidden and universal. The God-man. God, unity and difference. And then uh, chapter five, the human vocation. Part two, uh, the book is in entitled Initiation for Warfare. Ecclesia, a place for rebirth. And then the subsection is bride and mother. Scripture, the first sacrament. Baptism, entry into a new life. The Eucharist, power to make, the power to make divine. The Eucharist, foundation of the church. Eucharist, practices and stones and people. So Eucharist is a Greek word. If charisto means, it means thank you. So the Eucharist has this uh, thanking this, this gratitude built into it. And uh, just on an aside, ultimately Heidegger in his book, um, what is called thinking, uh, actually comes to this conclusion that thinking is thinking, right? And it's, it's very similar. Um, and I wasn't aware of this, this kind of connection here until recently. Um, more subsections, the interior combat, confidence and humility, passion, trans, passions transfigured, thought transcended. Part three is approaches to contemplation. And then there's a, a large section on prayer here is what is prayer trials, times and postures for prayer, how to pray to become prayer. A subsection again is the glory of God hidden in creatures. Another subsection, ecstasy and ecstasy into the unknown love and inebriation, darkness and light, God's house, inward birth, the embrace of the infinite, the birth of the glorious body martyrdom, death and resurrection, and then deification. 
Last section is entitled "Difficult: The Difficulty, The Difficult Love, The Foundations of Love, The Demands of Love, A Paradoxical Morality, In the World but Not of It, and Hell and the Communion of Saints." And then there's some uh, biographical notes, theological notes, and then there's kind of a section after that as well. So it, it, fascinating topics and. Um, started reading a little bit of it and it, it uh, was really insightful and impactful for me. So I'm going to read a little bit of the preface and the introduction here and see if it resonates with you guys here. So from the preface, Christianity is in the first place an oriental religion and it is a mystical religion. These assertions sound strange today in an age when it is generally assumed that to be Christian means to lead a good life. As for prayer, what does that amount to but a set of exercises, which are both pointless and tedious? Nevertheless, whilst our consumer society has lost all feeling for mysticism, on the fringes there are thousands of people thirsting for it. When we see the shallow syncretism, the sentimental fascination with anything Eastern, and the bogus gurus crowding round for the pickings, it is easy to sneer. But instead of laughing, the churches ought to be examining their conscience, their consciences. Whose fault is it that they, that so many have to resort to Tao or Zen in order to rediscover truths, which were actually part of the Christian heritage right from the beginning? Who has hidden from them the fact that of all Oriental religions, Christianity is the best and most complete? That mysticism is as necessary to humanity as science, if not more so. Intellectual research may be exciting, but it will not lead us to the secret of life. Nor will the truth be found through consumerism, though of course we must eat. Nor will it be found through action, although action is inevitable if we are to restrain our tendency to exploit one another. The researcher, the consumer, the politician, are merely the avatars of a much deeper human nature. Intellectual knowledge, possession, action, all express a desire which transcends them. The human being is a craftsman and rational, so a craftsman, faber, and rational sapiens, qualities which we share with the higher animals. The difference between us being one of degree and not of kind, but more importantly than that, we are mystical. In other words, our roots are in fact religious and artistic, and therefore non-rational or rather supra-rational. As soon as our material needs are satisfied, deeper needs assert themselves. It is now 20 centuries since Jesus declared that man does not live by bread alone, and we know today that not even the most effective psychoanalytic treatment can cure us of the deep sense of disquiet within us. There is not a superman or revolutionary who is not beset by unappeased desires. The fathers of the Christian church, for whom prayer was as natural as breathing, discovered this truth before we did, saying, quote, birds fly, fishes swim, and man prays, close quote. Islamic spiritual writers would later express the same idea, saying that the first cry of the newborn, babe, and the last breath of the dying person together make up and proclaim the divine name. This anthology of the first Christian mystics therefore meets an urgent need, that of rediscovering the mystical sources of Christianity. It is not so much an anthology as a selection of passages with an extended and lively commentary. The authors represented here do not appear in chronological or alphabetical order. The extracts are arranged according to a theological plan, since the book deals specifically with Christian mystics, those whose spirituality bears the deep marks of the revelation received from God. Most of these texts are hard to find, and many have been out of print for a long time. Some of them will seem astonishingly modern, others more obscure but all should prove interesting. For mysticism is an existential attitude, a way of living at a greater depth. It is not the possession of any one religion or of any one church. Even atheists can be mystics. 
But perhaps Christianity with its fresh vitality was able to reconcile negation and, aff and affirmation in a new way. Perhaps it was able to unite together the divine and the human whilst neither confusing nor separating them. That vitality is still possible today. Indeed, the very future of the human race depends on, upon it. It is my hope that Oliver Clement's fine work will convince the reader of this truth. All right, we'll get into the uh, introduction next, and I'll probably read the first, maybe the first section. Uh, it's about you know 10 or 13 pages or so, and kind of see where it goes from there. So, introduction. This book is intended not so much to popularize its subject as to make it known in the first place. Not only is Christianity something strange to people today, but it cannot even attract by its strangeness because people are familiar with the distortions and caricatures of it which are constantly being hawked, out, hawked about. Therefore, in response to many requests, I have tried to allow the chief witness of the undivided church to speak for themselves, to make audible the voice of tradition, from which all the churches spring and which alone enables them to share in an ecumenism, ecumenism in time by recalling the experience in which they had their common origin. Tradition is not a written text with which we can choose to agree or disagree. It is not material suitable for dissection by scholars. It is the expression of the spirit, juvenescence, as Irenaeus of Lyon says, quote, in its youthfulness. It is, of course, our foundation, foundation history, but it is also a living force. A tremendous Passover, a passing over from the God-man to God-humanity and to the universe, to quote the Russian religious philosophers whose disciple I gladly acknowledge myself to be. There can be no doubt that since the 4th or 7th century, our spiritual awareness has changed profoundly. We live in the aftermath of Auschwitz, Hiroshima, and the Gulag. Christendom, the society in which Christianity was, to the great detriment of freedom, the dominant ideology has finally collapsed, and we, no longer, and we can no longer talk about matters of faith in the way that we used to. The living God is no longer the emperor of the world, but crucified love. Remember that many of the witnesses whose voices we are about to hear lived in the times of persecution, when society veered between skepticism on the one hand and various forms of gnosis on the other. Others lived during the emergence of the monastic movement, which, in the face of the blandishments of the establishment, sternly and recklessly asserted the irreducible nonconformity of the person who is drunk with God, the one who after God regards his brother as God. Newman compared the earlier history of the church to the opening chords of a symphony when the subjects which will later be brought out one by one are introduced altogether in a concentrated burst of creativity. It was in 553, after all, that the Fifth Ecumenical Council reaffirmed that God suffered death in the flesh. In making my selection, I have been guided by tradition, continuing into our own time, which is a time of darkness worthy of a vision of Dostoevsky, teeming with expectations and intuitions, while seeds of fire multiply in the earth beneath. The witness whose words I have gathered are known as the fathers. Some of these first mystics were martyrs, others were monks in the mountains and deserts. Others were great minds illuminated by the spirit which penetrated even through their foolishness, which tradition has been able to balance against the consensus of other fathers. Many were bishops elected by their people to be pastors of local churches, secure and independent at the heart of their spiritual communities where they preached the only good news which can possibly reach us today in our state of hopeless nihilism. The descent of the God of the God made man into death and hell so that he might triumph over death and hell in whatever shape they appear. In those days, mysticism was not analyzed in terms of religious psychology as it is in the West today. The whole of life, the whole universe was interpreted in the light of Christ's death and resurrection, which was the key to understanding all significant processes of change. A few individuals, to be sure, shone out like candles or torches. But, quote, the light and the fire which was concentrated in them is offered to all in the dazzling flesh 
of the Bible and the sacraments through the church, which is the mystery of him who was crucified and, and is risen, who restores us to life and brings us about in himself the transfiguration of the cosmos. The state of ecclesial being, to adopt the expression of a modern Greek theologian, was a fact of experience for the person in communion for whom humanity and the universe were their very nature resurrectional and paschal. This understanding far transcends our endless debates about the church as an institution. This book first approaches the subject doctrinally, reflecting in the mystery rather than on it, because we must not only love God, but must love him, as the gospel says, with all of our mind. Then we deal with the path of ascesis, the spiritual combat harder than the battles of men, the objective of which, however, is to let go. Finally, we come to contemplation, which is expressed most clearly in a capacity for loving, with a love that is creative, because it is an activity shared with the incarnate and crucified God. This book will also, we hope, make it possible to judge more precisely where Christianity stands in relation to other world religions and to the various forms of atheism. Indeed, as we consider the basic themes of the three-in-one and the divine humanity, the universal and traditional experience of the divine may come to appear no less clear and compelling than the modern Western experience of the human. The following pages therefore contain, one, texts translated so as to appeal as directly as possible to non-specialists. Slight tr transpositions or adaptations have been made here and there the better to convey the spirit of the original. 2. An accompanying commentary, which goes some way to compensate for the necessarily fragmentary and disjointed selection of texts, and which in itself forms a kind of essay. And finally, three, notes at the end of the book in alphabetical order of authors quoted, referring to the works from which the texts have been taken. These notes provide the indispensable historical element describing briefly the characters and lives of the writers and helping us to distinguish the ephemeral from the lasting, or in the communion of saints from the eternal. Finally, I have added notes on Arianism, early monasticism, and monophysitism. So, that's from the introduction from the author Oliver Clement. I'm moving along to chapter one. It's entitled Quiet Quest, Encounter, and Decision. <clears throat> Human beings are mere scraps of life, here only for an instant. We live in a dead life, according to Gregory of Nyssa, in a world permeated by death, in which everything gravitates continually towards nothingness. And this is the root of all our ill, for unlike the animals, we know we are going to die. But our very anguish is a source of grace, for it betrays a longing for being and unity, a yearning to know the being and the one. The anguish and the grace are a constant theme of Augustine of Hippo, the Western Church Father. We may find him somewhat schematic, but his cry from the heart demands to be heard. And here is a, uh, here's a quote, a long quote from him. Brethren, do our years last? They slip away day by day. Those which were no longer are. Those to come are not yet here. The former are past. The latter will come, only to pass away in their turn. Today exists only in the moment in which we speak. His first hours have passed, and remainder, the remainder do not yet exist. They will come, but only to fall into nothingness. Nothing contains constancy in itself. The body does not possess being. It has no permanence. It changes with age. It changes with time and place. It changes with illness and accident. The stars have as little constancy. They change in hidden ways. They go whirling through space. They are not steady. They do not possess being. Nor is the human heart any more constant. How many thoughts disturb us? How many thoughts disturb it? How many ambitions? How many pleasures draw it this way and that, tearing it apart? The human spirit itself, although endowed with reason, changes. It does not possess being. It wills and does not will. It knows and does not know. It remembers and forgets. 
No one has in himself the unity of being. After so many sufferings, diseases, troubles, and pains, let us return humbly to that one being. Let us enter into that city whose inhabitants share in being itself. It's from Augustine of Hippo, commentary on Psalm 121. Back to the text here. It is true that human beings have been eager to achieve unity by themselves, to be their own masters, and to depend only on themselves. But that is an adventure like Lucifer's, which leaves us in pure nihilism. This is why metanoia, the great turning around of the mind and heart, and of our whole grasp of reality. From John Climacus here, quote, Is the daughter of hope, it is the run- renunciation of despair. Let me read that again. So, that is why metanoia, the great turning around of the mind and heart, and for our whole grasp of reality, is the daughter of hope. It is the renunciation of despair. This is a matter not of mere speculation, but of life or death, of life stronger than death. For communion with God is life, and separation from God is death. From Uranius of Lyons. A life without eternity is unworthy of the name of life. Only eternal life is true. From Augustine of Hippo again. That is still true, even though turning to God is generally considered madness these days, even more than it was in the Roman Empire at the peak of its glory. There's a sort of sleep of the soul, and people hope to escape death by sleepwalking or by losing themselves in frantic activity. Quote, Abbot Anthony says, A time is coming when people will go mad, and when they meet someone who is not mad, they will turn to him and say, You are out of your mind, just because he is not like them. As from sayings of the Desert Desert Fathers, Anthony. Moving on. Anguish and despair are not the only starting point. There is only our sense of wonder and the riddle which we perceive and the order and beauty of the world on the one hand and all the events of history on the other. Through intelligent and beautiful forms of creation, the invisible gives structure and balance to the visible. But the means employed are gravity, death, disintegration. Humanity, likewise, consciously or not, draws from the invisible not only the very idea of justice, but also the high demands of knowledge and art, and the possibility of those laws that set a limit to violence and protect friendship. Quote, Who gave you the ability to contemplate the beauty of the skies, the course of the sun, the round moon, the millions of stars, the harmony and rhythms that issue from the world as from a lyre, the return of the seasons, the alteration of the months, the demarcation of the day and night, the fruits of the earth, the vastness of the air, the ceaseless motion of the waves, the sound of the wind. Who gave you the rain, the soil to cultivate, food to eat, arts, houses, laws, a republic, cultivated manners, friendship with your fellows? It's from Gregory Nazenzian, uh, On Love for the Poor. Continuing on. Through anguish and wonder, humanity has some inkling of the great depth of divine wisdom. But no full understanding is possible, only a holy fear, a trembling in the face of the immeasurable. Here's a quote from John Chrysostom. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, I praise thee, for thou art fearful and wonderful. There are many things in which we marvel without fear. For example, the beauty of architecture, the masterpieces of painting, or the glory of the human form. We also marvel at the vastness and infinite depth of the sea, but to be above that depth is also terrifying. In the same way, the sacred writer, as he leaned out over the infinite abyss of God's wisdom, was seized with giddiness. Filled with wonder, he drew back trembling and said, I praise thee, for thou art fearful and wonderful. Wonderful are are thy works. And again, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. That was from the the incomprehensibility of God, again from John Chrysostomo. 
right, moving forward here, we can see the whole process displayed in the life of a certain Hilary of Poitiers, a 4th century Roman French citizen remarkable for his relevance to ourselves. The elite of the declining Roman Empire lived in an intellectual climate very like our own, materialism and skepticism, together with dabblings in synchristic, synchronist, syncretist, syncretist beliefs, were resulting in a mixture very different from the ancient religions, which had long ago been rendered obsolete by rationalism and the discovery of the individual. In short, what was then true of restricted urban groups is now true of everybody. Hillary quickly took the measure of a society bent upon instant gratification and driven on by his horror at, a, at the prospect of purposelessness and nothingness, set out on the search for the meaning of life. Passing rapidly through stupid materialism and decaying paganism and pseudo-scientific occultism, he discovered the biblical teaching of the Jews, the living God who transcends all things, yet is present in them. Outside everything, yet inside. The eccentric center, the author of beauty disclosed in the beauty of the world. But only the gospel of the word made flesh, the gospel of the resurrection of the flesh, could assure him that he would not be reduced to non-being. That he, Hillary, was an irreplaceable person and would be wholly loved and saved, body and soul, by the combination of grace and his own freedom. And here is a Long, long quote from Hillary, I suppose, here. I began the search for the meaning of life. At first, I was attracted by riches and leisure. But most people discover that human nature wants something better to do than just gourmandize and kill time. They have been given life in order to achieve something worthwhile, to make use of their talents. It cannot have been given them without some, ben some benefit in eternity. How otherwise could one regard as a gift from God a life so eaten away by anguish, so riddled with vexation, which left to itself would simply wear out, from the prattle of the cradle to the drivel of senility? Look at the people who have practiced patience, chastity, and forgiveness. The good life for them meant good deeds and good thoughts. Could the immortal God have, have given, us a life, given us life with no other horizon but death? Could he have inspired us with such a desire to live if the only outcome would be the horror of death? Then I sought to know God better. Some religions teach that there are different families of deities. They imagine male gods and female ones and can trace the lineage of these gods born from one another. Other religions teach that there are greater and lesser deities with different attributes. Some claim that there is no God at all and worship nature, which, according to them, came out purely by chance. Most, however, admit that God exists, but hold him to be indifferent to human beings. I was reflecting on these problems when I discovered the books which the Jewish religion says were composed by Moses and the prophets. There I discovered that God bears witness to himself in these terms, I am who I am, and say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I was filled with wonder at this perfect definition, which translates into intelligible words, the incomprehensible knowledge of God. Nothing better suggests God than being. He who is can have neither end nor beginning. And since God's eternity cannot contradict itself in order to assert his unapproachable eternity, God needed only to assert solemnly that he is. But it was necessary also to recognize God's work, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span. And later, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. All these things my, hands, my hand has made from Isaiah. The whole heavens are held in God's hand, the whole earth in the hollow of his hand. The heaven is also his throne and the earth his footstool. We should certainly avoid too human an image of God as someone sitting on a throne with his feet on a footstool. 
His throne and footstool are his infinite omnipotence, which embraces everything in the hollow of his, of his hand. The imagery borrowed from created things signifies that God exists in them and outside of them, that he both transcends and pervades them, that he surpasses all creatures and yet dwells in them. The hollow of his hand symbolizes the power of his divinity revealing itself. The throne and the footstool show he controls show he controls external objects because he is within them, but at the same time he envelops them and encloses them within himself. He is inside and outside everything. Nothing is beyond the reach of the one who is infinite. What came to light as a result of my search was well expressed by the prophet. Quote, Whither shall I go from the spirit, from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me, and thy right hand shall hold, hold me. There is no place without God. Place does not exist except in God. I was happy contemplating the mystery of his wisdom and his unapproachableness. I worship the eternity and immeasurable greatness of my Father and Creator. But I longed also to behold the beauty of my Lord. My ardor, deceived by the weakness of my mind, was trapped in its own search. When I discovered in the words of the prophet this magnificent thought about God, for from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. The sky and the air are beautiful. The earth and the sea are beautiful. By divine grace, the universe was called by the Greeks cosmos, meaning ornament. Surely the author of all created beauty must himself be the beauty in all beauty. But if we are blessed with an intuition of a God, what shall we gain from it if death does away with all feeling and puts an irre 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 irrevocable end to a weary existence. My mind was bewildered, trembling for itself and for its body. It was troubled as at its fate and that of the body in which it was dwelling when, following on from the law and the prophets, I made the acquaintance of the teaching of the gospel and of the apostles. Here's a quote. In the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, yet the world knew Him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. That was from John. My intellect overstepped its limits at that point, and I learnt more about God than I had expected. I understood that my Creator was God born of God. I learnt that the Word was God and was with Him from the beginning. I came to know the light of the world. I understood that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Those who welcome Him become children of God by a birth, not in the flesh, but in faith. This gift of God is offered to everyone. We can receive it because of our freedom, which is, was given us expressly for this purpose. This very power given to each person to be a child of God was bogged down in weak and hesitant faith. Our own difficulties make hope painful. Our desire becomes infuriating with our faith, and our faith grows weak. That is why the Word was made flesh. By means of the Word made flesh, the flesh was enabled to raise itself up to the Word. Without surrendering His divinity, God was made of our flesh. My soul joyfully received the revelation of this mystery. By means of my flesh, I was drawing near to God. By means of my faith, I was called to a new birth. I was able to receive this new birth from on high. I was assured that it could not be reduced to non-being. Close quote. That was from Hilary of Poitiers, The Trinity.
couple more pages here and then we'll God is absolute beauty because he is absolute personal existence. As such, he awakens our desire, sets it free, and draws it to himself. He sets beings within their limits, but he calls them into communion with one another without confusing them. Being himself beyond movement and re or rest, he gives to each creature an identity that is, that is exact and distinct, but is nevertheless capable of development when brought to life by the dynamic power of love. Here is a, um, a block quote from Dionysus, the Areopagite. Areopagite. <clears throat> God is beauty. This beauty is the source of all friendship and all mutual understanding. It is this beauty which moves all living things and preserves them whilst filling them with love and desire for their own particular sort of beauty. For each one, therefore, beauty is both its limit and the object of its love, since it is its goal. In its model, for it is by its likeness to this beauty that everything is defined. Thus true beauty and goodness are mixed together, because whatever the force may be that moves living things, it tends always towards beauty and goodness. And there is nothing that does not have a share in beauty and goodness. By virtue of this reality, all creatures subsist, united and separate, identical and opposite, alike and unlike. Contraries are united, and the, and the united elements are not confused. By virtue of beauty and goodness, everything is in, is in communion with everything else, each in its own way. Creatures love one another without losing themselves in one another. Everything is in harmony. Parts fit snugly into the whole. One generation succeeds another. Spirits, souls, and bodies remain in the same time steady and mobile, because for all of them, beauty and goodness is time, is, is at once repose and movement, being itself beyond both. It's beautiful. The language of souls is their desire. Gregory the Great. Commentary on the Book of Job. The language of souls is their desire. Moving on. God is love. He is the ecstasy of love, overflowing outside himself, enabling creatures to share in his life. Through his life, they share the same overflowing force, which we see already displayed in Eros, the love of man and woman, and which is designed to be perfected in holiness, in conscious fellowship with him, who is the fullness of beauty and goodness. Amidst horror and death, there is something greater, the secret of love. The story of creation is a magnificent song of songs. Desire is in the first place God's desire for us, to which all human, or to be exact, divine human, Eros, is seeking to respond. The inspired poet of Eros is Gregory Nazanzian, and Maximus, and Maximus the Confessor commenting on him does not hesitate to equate Eros with agape, Latin caritas, disinterested love, considerateness and service which participates in the love of God for his creatures. Eros expresses chiefly a nature, a natural impulse, agape, a meeting between persons that is full of tenderness. One might say that Eros is meant to become the subject of agape. Quote from Dionysus the Arpagate again here. In God, the Eros desire is outgoing, ecstatic, because of it, lovers no longer belong to themselves, but to those whom they love. God also goes outside of himself when he captivates all creatures by the spell of his love and his desire. In a word, we might say that beauty and goodness is the object of the Eros desire and is the Eros desire itself. Now for Maximus the Confessor. God is the producer and generator of tenderness and Eros. He has set outside himself what was within himself, namely creatures, which is why it is said of him, God is love. The Song of Songs call him, ag call him agape, or sensual pleasure, and desire, which means eros. Insofar as the eros desire originates from him, he can be said to be the moving force of it, since he generated it. 
but in so far as he is himself the true object of the love, he is the moving force in others who look to him and possess, according to their own nature, the capacity for desire. Hence the conclusion of Clemicus. Blessed is the person whose desire for God has become like the lover's passion for the lip from the beloved from the ladder of divine ascent. Even more than hunger, thirst, which can so torment someone in the desert, express expresses the desire for God. And what and what thirst there is today. More from John Clemacus. Hunger makes itself felt only gradually and vaguely, but the raging of intense thirst is unmistakable and intolerable. No wonder the person who longs for God cries, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. That is the mysterious dialectic of faith, hope, and charity. God never, sees, God never ceasing to empty out souls in order to fill them up better. Here's from Augustine of Hippo again. Desire for vision, faith. Desire for possession, hope. Desire for love, charity. By expectation, God increases desire. By desire, he empties out souls. And emptying them out, he makes them more capable of receiving him. It's from the commentary on the first epistle of St. John. More from Augustine here. Within the person, the inward thirst is awoken. The inward eye is opened. Hasten to the springs, draw from the wells. In God is the wellspring of life, a spring that can never fail. In his light is found a light that nothing can darken. Desire the light which your eyes know not. Your inward eye is preparing to see the light. Your inward thirst burns to be quenched at the spring. Got one more page here. If you guys are still with me. So then God offers himself, wishes to disclose himself, but he does not force us. His power is the power of love, and love wants the freedom of the beloved. God speaks and at the same time keeps silence. He knocks at the door and waits. Everything is dependent upon the royal freedom of faith. Everything hangs upon our decision. From Gregory Anissa's Life of Moses. Here in the spiritual realm, birth is not the result of intervention from outside, as happens with bodily creatures who reproduce in an external way. Spiritual birth is the result of free choice, and we are thus, in a sense, our own parents, creating ourselves as we went to be, as we want to be, freely fashioning ourselves according to the pattern of our choice. The last long quote here from Benedict of Nursia. So this is the wonderful call to conversion, a conversion attested by deeds. The father of Western monasticism, St. Benedict, throws out the challenge. And this is what I'm going to leave you guys with this last block quote here. Then let us arise. Scripture invites us in the words, It is full time now for you to wake from sleep. With, with our eyes open to the light that transfigures our ears filled with the thunder of his voice, let us listen to the powerful voice of God, urging us day by day. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Harden not your hearts. And again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And what does he say? Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Walk, walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. Moreover, the Lord, in seeking among the crowd for someone to work for him, says, Who is there who desires life? If you hear him answer, I do, God says to you, do you desire true life, eternal life? Then keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And when you have done this, I will set my eyes upon you. I will give ear to your prayers. And before they call, I will answer. The Lord waits for us to respond day by day to his holy counsels by our actions. In fact, the days of this life are given us as a respite to correct our errors, as the Apostle Paul says, quote, 
Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And in his loving kindness, the Lord says, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? That is the end of uh, chapter 1. That was the introduction, the preface in chapter 1. I hope you guys are still with me. It's been a kind of a, a longer video than I wanted to make, but uh, thanks for listening, and uh, God bless.